Hi guys, welcome back to another edition of The Sugar Show with myself, Emily McGuire and Karen Thompson. And today we have two of our favorite people ever in this space. It is Drs. Michael and Mary Dan Eats. And for those of you that don't know them, um, I'm quite surprised anybody who doesn't, but Drs. Mike and Mary Dan are recognized as weight loss experts and are the authors of 15 books on health and nutrition, including the New York Times bestseller, Protein Power and its follow-up, The Protein Power Life Plan. Their books, which have sold over 4 million copies to date. They are a husband and wife team who since the um, mid-1980s have advocated the use of a diet higher in protein and good fat, a diet which is more like the natural human diet for many thousands of generations. As the most effective tool for weight loss and health improvement in that sense, you could call, you could call them the oldest living paleo and low-carb gurus. They've devoted their medical careers first to caring for overweight patients and those with weight related health issues and more recently to nutritional research seeking a better understanding of the optimal human diet welcome and thank you so much for being on with us how are you guys doing what? <laughs> right in oh no we, oh i thought we'd lost you guys there um so for anybody who who doesn't know you guys do you mind just telling us how you you even got into this how did you guys become the gurus of low carb nutrition um, longevity well, yeah longevity <laughs> the uh i don't know you know years and years ago back in the early 80s i uh kind of bloomed into my own state of obesity and we had a, a big family practice at the time seeing lots and lots of patients and i started fiddling around with ways to lose weight and i came across uh one of these fasting plans uh it was called medifast at the time and so i decided to uh, get all the stuff and and start running one of those in, in our clinic and i got it all and when i read it uh, I read the thing and I thought, gosh, this is uh, actually a low carb diet. And I was, at the time, I mean, I didn't have any biases at all. And, uh, and, and all the papers that they put in my little training kit talked about the benefits of low carb dieting and how this plan worked to make you lose weight. And I thought it was really strange that after people completed the fasting part of it, then they went on to a high carb diet. That didn't make any sense to me. So I decided to adapt it to my own patient population at the time. And except instead of putting them on a, a low fat diet, when they get lost their weight, putting them on a low carb diet. And that's kind of how the whole thing started. And then we started, uh, and you know, she, help because we were working in the same clinic. Actually, we had two different clinics. And so I was doing it in one and she was doing it in another. And then we kind of came together and said, you know, why do the whole fasting thing with all these shakes? Let's just do it with food and see what happens. And so we started putting people on, uh, on all food, low carb diets and they did great. And then we started tweaking and refining from there. And that was the genesis of the whole thing. Oh, sorry. I think my <laughs> I think my internet is going a little bit. Okay, Em's having some problems with the internet there. Um, and then when did you guys decide to write the book? How did your was your first book Protein Power, right? No, no. no my actually. first book was Thin So Fast because I we'd done so well on the fasting thing. I decided that you know at that time the only ones that you could do is bizarre but at that time there were really no protein powers no meal protein replacement powders, powders <laughs> no meal replacement <laughs> products on the market mm -hmm. uh i mean they're everywhere now but there were none then this was back in the you know the early to mid 80s and so i started to i decided you know this is safe to do uh the fact that uh well at the time I, they were done in hospitals yeah. and they cost thousands and yeah. thousands and thousands of dollars or in, in doctor's office and cost and thousands cost, of dollars yeah. but that was the only way that you could get these meal replacement uh products was either through a hospital-based setting or a doctor's office so we decided to create one in our kitchen which we did which i later found out was the very way the guy that did medifast did it mm -hmm. but we created this product in our kitchen by mixing some stuff together. You could buy protein powers. Bodybuilders bought those. But they were nasty. Uh, but yeah, they, they tasted terrible. So we had to figure out a way to make them taste uh, acceptable Decent. and at the same time uh, uh, work. 
And at that time, you mixed this stuff. If you can believe it, you mixed it with soft drinks, diet, well, soft, diet drinks. soft drinks. You know, diet Seven Up or diet Coke or diet Doctor Pepper. Or you could mix it with water. You could it really was awful with water. But if you put it in the diet soft <laughs> drinks, and then you you would you know blend it, and it, it with ice, and it poured up into a shake, and they were actually pretty good. Um, and so that's uh, we we taught people how to do that, or I did in a, in a book called Thin So Fast which uh, quietly sank beneath the waves. And uh, then the, then we got approached to do what turned out to be protein power. And uh, thankfully it didn't sink beneath the waves and sold about four million copies. And yeah, and it's, it's, I think for most people, when I find how they got into this, you can often say it's kind of one of sort of three books and the majority, everybody has always read your guys' book. It is, and for anybody who hasn't read it or looking for the cornerstone, it's, it's packed full with so much and so much history. And that's what I love with you guys as well, as you take a look, you know, kind of right back and even at the, you know, anthropology kind of aspect with it all. So, so that case, so when did the book come out again? When was Protein Power released? 19, was it? 1996. 20 years ago. <laughs> oh, I've like had 20 year kind of edition come out. That would be super cool. Yeah, well, we're, we're kind of working on that. We're working yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. So how was it received when it first came out? Because that was sort of, you know, not, you know, kind of we know about the 80s where the guidelines were changed and it was all about low fat. So what was it kind of like in that time? Uh, skeptically is how yes. I would say it was received by, um, you know, by the media initially. And... Um, Oh, that was kind of interesting, you know, when you when you described how it all worked to doctors, even though they were indoctrinated in low carb, when they understood the biochemistry of it, it would they would say, Yeah, hey, you know, that that's right. Now they may not recommend it because yeah. they were still so bound up and they still are in many ways, so bound up in low and low fat. But um, you know, people kind of started grasping onto it at the um the media was interested in it because it was controversial at the time. You know, you'd had, it was interesting, you know, Oprah Winfrey lost all this weight on a, on a protein sparing fast. And you know, when Mike was writing Thin So Fast, he had the manuscript, actually the finished manuscript sent to his book publisher the day that Oprah came out and revealed that it was a, a low carb protein sparing fast that she'd lost all her weight on. And so, you know, everybody went kind of crazy over low carb fasting at the time. And then the, you know, by the time protein power came out, which was, oh golly, um, no. six years later, yeah. maybe six years later, um, everything had kind of settled back into low fat again. And it was very entrenched. Uh, in fact, when we, we were thinking about writing a cookbook, a companion cookbook to protein power, and we went down to uh, the local uh, big box bookstore and uh, looked around to see what was out there, and there were we counted 660 low fat cookbooks and not one low carb cookbook at the time that Protein Power came out. So, uh, uh, 20 years has changed a lot, yeah. Particularly when you see it today, there's so many cookbooks, uh -huh. you kind of so just kind of come on with that because now it does seem that there is, but what was kind of your practice with low carb? Kind of when you put a patient on it, what was sort of your cornerstone with, with how you kind of would approach sort of a low carbohydrate diet? Uh, well, we, we individualized it yeah. to each patient when they came in and we would sit down with them and, and we would explain to them um, something that everybody takes for granted now and nobody was talking about then, which is the whole concept of insulin resistance and how it develops um, and explaining it to a layman. To, so that they can really understand why it is they're making the changes that they're making, which is to control their own uh, metabolic hormones, basically, by what they And so we would sit them down, and based on their, uh, you know, lean body mass weight and, and other health parameters, you know, that we had gone over with them, we would set an amount of protein that was important for them to, uh, to try to get in every day based on supporting that lean body mass. And... Um, then we cut everybody's carbs down really sharply at first. We found over the years that if you if you piecemeal it and you you know say oh we'll just cut out this and just cut out that it just it prolongs the the 
transition over to getting firmly into a into a, a fat burning metabolic pathway. So we cut everybody's carbs down very you know very sharply at the outset and explain to them uh, how to construct meals around that structure and not to be afraid of fat and. Uh, that was probably the hardest going we had is to teach people back then not to be afraid of fat. And then we had them keep uh, mm -hmm. diet diaries. Very important. That when they came in, we were to, and it, it's to amazing, really, that amazed me is how, how many misconceptions mm -hmm. there are about what's uh, low carb and what isn't in the minds of the public. Mm -hmm. And we'd see people coming in saying that they weren't losing any weight at all and, and look at what they were doing and they were drinking orange juice and eating bananas. Why are, why are, you, why doing are you doing this? And they said, well, because we need the potassium. And we would say, that's why we give you a potassium supplement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or if you're going to do it, have a tomato. It's got a lot more potassium. Yeah. <laughs> and so anyway, it, it, there are a lot of misconceptions out there about what mm -hmm. uh, actually constitutes a good low carb diet and, and what actually carbohydrate is. Yeah, and, probably fewer now, but still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you ever come across anybody that there was any adverse effects with at all? Was there anybody, because that's one thing everyone says, it's bad for you and, you know, we can no. all day about that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the number one uh, sort of adverse effect is fatigue early on so we got ahead of them by telling people that uh, to expect it because when you're operating on your standard diet you've got all the enzymes in place to um, you know, make that diet work well in terms of, of providing energy and when you switch to a low carb diet suddenly all those enzymes don't work anymore and you've well, got to generate to new enzymes and it takes a while to do that and we told people look you're going to get uh, tired just walking out to the mailbox the first few days. You've just got to expect that. And once we forewarned them, that got rid of all that because then they'd say, yeah, you know, you're right about that. So it kind of confirmed uh, to them that it really was working and doing something. Mm -hmm. And and we never really told people to exercise because what we discovered over the years is that once, once people adapted to the low carb diet, mm -hmm. then their spontaneous exercise just Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. They would they would just start want doing stuff. They right. would want to go because they're trying to burn off all this uh, extra energy that they now have available to them because mm -hmm. the pores of the fat cells are open basically. Mm -hmm. So we never push them. You, know, you got to go out and start walking or do this or do that because we knew of this fatigue thing. And then another thing, people sometimes get fatigued down the way because they get a little bit depleted in potassium. Mm -hmm. And that's really easy to fix because we gave them a potassium supplement. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will get headaches and you tell them to up their salt intake and fluid. And, fluid. and that's a real counterintuitive thing because everywhere people look, everything they read, every doctor they talk to always tells them to cut back salt. And so mm -hmm. telling people to add salt. Eat dill pickles. Um, yeah, dill it was really <laughs> freaky to them. And, yeah. you know, drink bouillon, drink eat dill bouillon, pickles, yeah. drink pickles. <laughs> eat olives you know increase your salt intake mm -hmm. but those are the the, the the main adverse effects could all be corrected pretty easily uh, with some pretty simple maneuvers and the other adverse effects that you have to worry about uh, that are more serious uh, really are, are not a consequence of the low carb diet per se but a consequence of medicines people might be on because people that are on blood sugar medicines for example their blood sugar drops so rapidly on a low carb diet, you know, they can fall out on their face. And so what we did was when people came in on oral blood sugar medicines, we just took them off right at the start. Because, we are trained professionals. Yeah, we're trained this professionals. Don't try this <laughs> <home. laughs> yeah. We would take them off at the start because right. we knew what was going to happen. Right. And then we would add back in if necessary. And usually it wasn't necessary. And, you know, we tried at first mm -hmm. that, the tapering part of it. You got to remember back then, nobody knew how to do this. I mean, there was uh, not, I mean, now there are a lot of doctors that are experienced in using a low carb diet, and, and you can call people to find out, but we were feeling our way through the whole thing and uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. And so we learned that it's better to just take people off and then add back in as necessary. Same thing with certain blood pressure medicines, diuretics. A lot of people were on diuretics for blood pressure. Mm -hmm. 
And because a lot of people are overweight have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's basically most of it is insulin driven. And when you when you reduce the insulin levels, start getting rid of fluid through the kidneys quickly, blood pressure goes down. So we would take people off their diuretic medicines the same way. I mean, there's some medicines that, that uh, like ACE inhibitors are fine. That, that doesn't have an effect on it. But Beta blockers, you got to taper carefully. Yeah, and so, you got, so anyway, it, it, there's some changes you had to make in medications on people on low current diets, and always in terms of reducing the medicines. And occasionally, I guess, uh, I think that people complain of with low carb when they're starting a low carb diet, because it really is a change. It's change in bowel habits, constipation, for example, most commonly, although some people went the complete other way. Um, but for most people with constipation, it's, um, it's a pretty easy fix if you just make sure they're getting plenty of magnesium and make sure that they're getting plenty of water and more importantly than anything, not being afraid to eat fat. They need to eat plenty of fat. And then they generally don't have, you know, problems with constipation, but, uh, but some people do, some people did. And, and uh, that was not yeah. uncommon, I guess. You know, yeah. fat, but mainly the human body's designed to pretty much absorb all the fat mm -hmm. that it eats. But about, I don't know, anywhere from five to 7% makes it through. So if you up your fat intake, you up the amount of, you know, that five or 7% um, means that a little bit more gets into the bowel and it sort of, uh, so to speak, greases the chute. And, and so- <laughs> That's really uh, disgusting. <laughs> and so that, uh, that helps prevent the constipation. <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, I want to know what your um, opinion is on calories and do they matter? I mean, can you just eat unlimited calories and you'll be fine on a low carb diet? Uh, depends on if you're trying to lose weight yeah, or not. Depends on if you're trying if you're, to lose weight. If you're trying to lose weight. Then, you know, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting. No. <laughs> right. It's an interesting, yeah. If you're trying to lose weight, uh, you, you've got to be careful of the calories. The nice thing about a low carb diet is it's really satiating. So most people spontaneously restrict their mm -hmm. calories enough on a low carb diet that they lose weight. You know, on a low carb diet, what, what essentially happens metabolically is that you're able to open the doors to the fat cells so that fat can come out to be burned. And if, you, um, if you're eating enough calories that you don't need to burn any fat, even though the doors are open, it doesn't really come out. And so you've got to create this caloric deficit to do it. But most people do that spontaneously. Small women sometimes can't, struggle, yeah. and they've got to, they struggle, and so they've got to restrict calories. Big guys almost never have a struggle because they do it like crazy. They they restrict calories without being hungry, and they and, have a big metabolic right output just because of their size. But what's interesting is if you're trying to maintain weight, uh, you can really ratchet up the calories on a low carb diet, and then you don't seem to gain. Mm -hmm. And the uh, and you get the the health the other attendant health yeah. benefits of a low carb diet and um, people yeah people kind of increase their metabolic rate they increase their mm -hmm. what's called NEAT uh, which is uh, what is it non uh, exercise what is it NEAT. why is it that's so sad I can't even remember what it is but basically <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's fidgeting <laughs> fidgeting yeah uh, non exercise something thermogenesis uh -huh. but activity non-exercise yeah. activity thermogenesis yeah, but it's burning Woo. up you know people tap their foot they fidget they mm -hmm. move more they do all kinds of stuff that mm -hmm. is is they don't even think about right to to burn off the and excess that's one thing calories you do on a on a low fat diet a low calorie low fat diet people become very still i mean they they just they conserve calories so carefully and that's per gary taubes uh, i have to agree with that just reducing calories is a is a one way street into a trap. You just keep reducing them, and then your metabolism ratchets down, and you reduce them, and your metabolism ratchets down, and before you know it, you know you're living on lettuce and and, and not living. So I just I think it's important for people to get enough calories and not get focused on it. But there are people, particularly older, forty five or fifty and up, small women are the people that have the hardest time um, particularly if they don't have a whole lot to lose the ones that have a lot to lose do better but the ones with not very much to lose have a, a little bit of a struggle on any diet but even this one 
And um, see when it cut the one, um, what was the statement that you guys made in your book? It was, um, I think you said to divorce the terminology with weight loss. I, I might not, that's probably not word for word, but you often talk about it's more to do with fat loss rather than weight loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't remember the exact statement, but I remember really liking it and thought that because we have so many people that just fixate on the scale, right. um, you know, and it's kind of like we only lost 600 grams this week. And so what, what kind of is the difference and why should we be looking more at fat loss rather than weight loss? Because everything weighs. I mean, everything in you weighs. And so weight loss is such a crude tool. It doesn't really give you much positive feedback. I mean, I guess if you keep losing, you're ultimately going to get there. But what you want to lose is excess body fat. You don't really want to lose your lean muscle structure. You don't want to, you know, weaken your bones and your heart. You just want to lose fat. And so you should really focus on fat loss. And very often a better measure of that is volume, not weight. And so, you know, doing waist measurements and doing uh, how your clothing fits, you know, you know, that little black pencil skirt doesn't lie. If you not get into it and then you can get into it, something's happened even if the scale hasn't budged. And especially with women on a, a more protein-rich diet, uh, you'll see them pick up lean body pounds. They'll start to build some muscle and, and strengthen their bones and do those kind of things that way. And so they may be trading um, um, fat pounds that they've lost for lean body pounds that they've picked up and the scale will be frozen and, and they get so disappointed because the scale didn't go down. And I wish that you know people trying to lose weight didn't even weigh. I wish they just put on that black pencil skirt or that sure, belt just, they can't get around their waist. There was just some magic way to weigh the fat mass. Because <laughs> exactly. the, uh, Easy at home one. <laughs> I mean, people see fat. I mean, they don't actually see fat, but they see the results of it. You know, with lumps and on their on their body, and they tend to think of that as the fat that they're trying to lose, which is true. But more importantly is losing fat that's stuck in places it shouldn't be in the liver in the other organs because of the body handles fat in a, in a strange way. You've got certain areas of the body that, that are designed for fat storage. And so when you start gaining fat, that's where it all goes. And then when you reach a point, and it's a different point with different people, where fat starts getting stuck in other places stuck in the liver, it can get stuck in the organs, it can get stuck in, in the yeah, abdominal don't. cavities and places you don't want it to be. And when it gets there, it's called ectopic fat. And ectopic is a fancy term, medical term for meaning something's Not where it where shouldn't it's supposed be. To be. <laughs> and it's called ectopic fat. And ectopic fat, uh, the body regards as a, as a foreign body. And a foreign body is another medical term for something where it shouldn't be that's from outside the body, like a splinter or something like that. And everybody's had a splinter. And if you get a splinter in your hand, if you don't get it out, you know, it, it gets Bester. inflamed, it gets festers, it can get pus around it. And, and finally, the, the body itself gets rid of it. And the same thing happens with fat where it shouldn't be. But the body can't really get rid of it, but it, cre it creates an inflammatory uh, response to it. So that's why it's really good to get rid of ectopic fat. And that ectopic fat is usually the first to go when you start losing weight. And so sometimes people, even visually, it doesn't look like they're losing, but they really are. Yeah, and that's the most important fat to get rid of. And if you're losing that fat, well, at the same time, you've been on a protein-restricted diet. And a lot of people have been on protein-restricted diets, mm -hmm. even if they're on a regular diet, you're eating a lot of carbs. And suddenly you start getting protein and now you're building bone. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't think about protein in the bones, but the more important than are, calcium. Yeah, more important more than calcium. Mm -hmm. And people think only of calcium. So you, you start getting protein, you start getting stronger bones, which are a little bit heavier, and you start building a little bit of muscle mass, and that can compensate or offset on the scales the loss of this ectopic fat. And so sometimes people say, oh, guys, I'm not losing weight. But uh, they really are. They're losing fat, which is much more important. Mm -hmm. So throw out the scales altogether. That's what I say. Get rid of yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you discover it later on. I mean, you, I mean, if you don't, if you're not obsessive about it, if you weigh two or th every two or three weeks, you'll see a difference. Mm -hmm. But as people, are, you know, just kind of focus on that and jump on every day, and oh my God, I haven't right. lost anything. Or they lost retain it. a little fluid. Their weight goes up. Depending on, I mean, just what's in there. Yep, their weight goes up. 
Mm -hmm. It's such a crude measure, such almost a worthless measure to really show you what's going on in real time. Mm -hmm. And would you say this dietary approach, would you say there is um, people that's better suited for? Or would you say that there's people that shouldn't follow this approach? Or do you think it's fine for most people? It's good for humans. <laughs> um, yeah, you know. I, Thank goodness. It's good for yeah, animals yeah. too. <laughs> we'll probably get a lot of flack for saying this, but I think it's probably the best diet for just about everyone. I mean, there's some people that... Uh, you know, for taste issues, won't do it, and they would be better. Uh, you know, and another people diet, that will do well on a lot of diets. Yeah, and it might be better for them palatability-wise to right. do something else. And there are studies that have come out and shown that people that have insulin resistance do better on low-carb diets. And then they like to say that people that don't have insulin resistance do better than low-fat diets. But if you look at the papers. Uh, the ones that uh, that are not insulin resistant do the same on a low carb diet. Right. So you know it works for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's just that people that aren't insulin resistant can also do it with a low fat diet. But why would you want to? Mm -hmm. Um, I want to know about change the topic a bit and just focus a little bit on kids because it's a topic that not many people want to talk about because you get so much flack for it. Um, but we really are exposing our kids to such disastrous substances that we call food. So what do you think is the best food for children? What should we be feeding our kids? And, and how do we make that happen? Well, you, you, you need to limit their sugar for yeah. one thing. Oh, uh, dear. I knew that was going to happen. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, turn it off. I'll bear it. I'll sit on it. It'll go away in a minute. Kids, um, kids, uh, and the, how did you do that? I hung up on him. I know who it was. Kids, uh, um, you know, can tolerate a lot more carbohydrate than adults do, seemingly without a problem. And I can't tell you how many parents have mm -hmm. told us. Okay, uh, you know, overweight, diabetic. With hypertension and high cholesterol, parents have told us about their, you know, saying, God, my kids are so lucky they can eat anything. And I always say, Well, couldn't you too? Uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, Well, think about it. I mean, the problem is starting then. You didn't just wake up one morning and be like you are. This took a long time to develop. And those and kids it have your out, genes. Yeah, early. And those kids, have, your kids have your genes. Right. So I think it's really important to start with kids, even though they seem to suffer no ill effects from eating all this kind of crap. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know, and there are societies out there that do well on high carb diets. Uh, you know, in the world, hunter gatherer societies that mm -hmm. eat a lot of carbohydrates and seem to do well, mm -hmm. but they don't eat sugar and they don't eat highly refined carbohydrates. And they don't eat vegetable oils. Right, and they don't eat vegetable oils. And I think that those things kind of damage your metabolism. And once your metabolism is damaged, then about the only thing that's really going to fix it is a low carb diet. And it doesn't even really fix it, it just keeps it in check. Right. Uh, and so the best thing is not to damage your metabolism in the first place. And I think that if you avoid sugar, avoid flour, uh, avoid you know really refined carbs, and avoid vegetable oils, you probably um, don't damage your metabolism. Mm -hmm. So you let kids eat a, a more carb, but natural carbs, you know, let them eat more vegetable carbs and more fruit carbs than, uh, than maybe a, a, a sick adult would be able to right. eat and, and do well on. But, you know, you, you aren't really doing them any favors to, to feed them a, a steady diet anyway of processed food. You know, if it's, if it's real and doesn't carry a label, it's, it's probably okay. Okay, great. Um, I know M has a very interesting question she wants to ask you. <laughs> I want to know what your guys' opinion is on fasting. It might be a because bit of a... <laughs> it's a new buzzword, right? It's a new buzzword. There's a lot of people it's talking the about lowest that. of the low-carb diets. <laughs> 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 the very, very, very low-carb diet. And um, calories don't really matter, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think there are benefits of fasting. I don't necessarily think you need to 
do it forever, but um, I think there's some great benefits from fasting. If you clean cells out of junk, I mean, do all mm. kinds of good things when you fast, and and um, it certainly does control your calories and your carbs. Yeah. I mean, you do get benefits from fasting. I don't know that you get uh, all the benefits that some people tout uh, from it because I still, I mean, you have some people saying that it doesn't reduce your metabolic rate. I, uh, I would kind of disagree with that, but uh, uh, and I think the data shows otherwise. It seems strange to me that you can restrict calories and you reduce your metabolic rate. And everybody knows that. And so, how about if you completely restrict them and yet you're not going to reduce your metabolic rate? That's difficult for me to believe. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's a div, it's, you know, I don't think it hurts people at all to do it here and there, to do it a bit. I think intermittent fasting has been shown, uh, you know, that's kind of every other day fasting or uh, eating really low calories one day and then you know, full complement of calories the next. I think that that has been shown in enough studies to be immensely. Uh, uh, protective against a lot of things, and it. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm wholeheartedly support that we do that ourselves from mm -hmm. time to time. I think it's good to vary your meal times. I think it's good to sometimes eat breakfast and then fast until dinner. I think it's sometimes good to get up and not eat breakfast and eat in the middle of the afternoon the first time. We do that all the time, and not out of any you know program that we're on. It just Kind of works out that way sometimes, mm -hmm. and so I think varying meal times is great, and not keeping them always at the same time, and it actually makes you eat less because mm -hmm. when, whenever you eat, you get full, and mm -hmm. if, if you only eat once a day, you you don't eat three times what you would eat if you ate three times a day. So I think there are benefits to mm -hmm. fasting programs, and a lot of benefits to varying your the time that you eat and going for long periods of time without food because it gives your organs a chance to rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what, what I hate, I mean, I've seen some bad examples of people that do just the opposite to eat what they, um, they think is a really good diet and they just eat all the time. Mm -hmm. And they, the opposite they, of fasting. Yeah. The opposite <laughs> of fasting. And they, because you know, your body sends signals and if you send a signal that you're always eating, you're always going to be storing. You never get to the, the signal that says, hey, we need energy, so release the fat from the fat cells. Mm -hmm. And we know people who uh, eat uh, constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've always got a little bag of fruit. They've always got a little can of tuna. Even though what they're eating is good, or bell peppers all chopped up, or carrots, or little bitty <laughs> tomatoes, and, and you know, a can of sardines, but just they're never not eating all day long they're nibbling on this stuff mm -hmm. and even though the food itself is all good stuff just the fact that they're always getting the signal that i mean the only time that they're not eating is when they sleep mm -hmm. we are not sure about that yeah we're not sure about that since i've never slept with them <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like the people that eat six to seven meals kind of a day isn't it they kind of to keep their metabolism that. going yeah well, that that was sort of the um, the prescription, certainly when we were in med school and after, for for diabetics, people with hypoglycemia. People were told to eat, you know, six to eight small meals a day, just basically eat all the time. And I think that I think that was wrong information. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was a rationale for it at the time, but I think it was wrong information. I think you're you're better served to, you know, and one thing about about intermittent fasting is that break fast meal, whatever time of day it is, when it breaks the fast, mm -hmm. the food tastes so dang good when you have actually, you're actually hungry. And I think so many times anymore, people don't allow themselves to get hungry. They, uh, you know, they, they feel like they've got to eat breakfast at, you know, seven o'clock or six thirty, and they have to eat lunch at between noon and one and they have to have dinner at six o'clock. And then they, you know, I just think that humans weren't, weren't designed to live on that kind of a, of a, regimented schedule and I think it's good for you to, to actually f experience real hunger, not emotional hunger, but real hunger and, uh, and, and then satisfy that hunger. It's just a, it's a wonderful sensation. 
Um, I've got two questions. Number one, what is your thought on supplements? And number two, I'll ask after that, actually. <laughs> number two, you'll ask all later. Right. Number two. Uh, what are our thoughts on supplements? Um, 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 it depends on the supplement. I think that okay. people ought to take a magnesium every day. I think that people who live where Emily lives for whatever reason should take vitamin <laughs> <that. laughs> You should always take vitamin <laughs> D. golf course, Mike. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> should take vitamin D. Uh, I, you know, I think if you have a well-designed diet, that you don't need a lot of supplements. I mean, they're nice for, a, I insurance. guess, just insurance, fairly inexpensive insurance, but I don't think you need a lot unless you're trying to serve, uh, uh, to solve specific problems. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then there are supplements that can do that or that at least can work on it. But I think just for a, for a supplement regimen, I mean, what I take every day is I take, uh, if it's in the winter, uh, I take a vitamin D, uh, vitamin D3. I take about 5,000 IU a day. Uh, mm -hmm. I take a magnesium. I take um, uh, potassium every once in a while, uh, just because I'm a, on a low carb diet all the krill. time. I take a krill oil mm -hmm. uh, because it's an omega-3, uh, highly- uh, uh, Absorbed know, in the brain. Highly polyunsaturated omega-3, that if I take a krill, I can get by with less of it than with fish oil, and I think PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acids, are not the greatest thing in the world, but omega-3s are pretty good. And the way that the fats are connected in krill oil is uh, as a phospholipid instead of a triglyceride. And so that makes them more absorbable so you can get by with Get the same effect with less. Uh, and I take um, alpha lipoic acid, which just um, helps a little bit with cellular energy. And I think that's about it as far as what I take every day. Yeah. And um, uh, every but now and then I'll throw back a multivitamin or I'll do something yeah. just in case I'm deficient in something that can, uh, that and can you fix put it. And concentrate drops in your water. Yeah, yeah. A few. But the, the main thing is that if you, if you ate really high yeah. quality food in, in kind of in a perfect way, you could get everything essentially that you need. But people don't. Either they don't do it because they don't like certain things, they avoid certain things. I mean, you can get all kinds of good things in broccoli and people won't eat it. They don't like it or whatever. So uh, I think it's it's kind of cheap insurance. Um, and, you know, I take I, I take more supplements than he does. I take, um, I take CoQ10 every day, um, which I think is important, you know, for some people. Certainly I have a strong family history for heart disease and, and I take CoQ10 every day because of that. Um, and she's taking a step. I'm not taking a step. <laughs> I am not taking a step. Oh, you are terrible, Mike. <laughs> terrible. That would be divorce court. That would be divorce It would be seppuku for me. Um, so no, no statins, but uh, but I do think CoQ10 is important. So I take one of the not every day. I take it every other day, actually. And you know, just certain things. I take a I take a brain supplement. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm so smart. <laughs> she needs really it. Are. No, he, he needs it, but I can't get him to take it. And but, I throw back a CoQ10 every now and then. Yeah. Just, he's so. very, he's really very sporadic about everything. He's. Oh. Well, it doesn't seem to, I mean, it seems to be working, whatever he's doing, both of you. Um, <laughs> oh, and, and I, I, <laughs> <be. laughs> I mean, I recently started taking one of your, um, supplements that you developed called Metabasol. Yeah. Um, and actually, for the first time in, the, in about 10 years since I've had my kids, my legs are coming back, and I'm so excited to see my legs appearing. Um, because, you know, when I went on to the low-carb way of life, I didn't lose a lot of weight because I wasn't morbidly obese. I wasn't particularly overweight, and, and it was hard, you know. I found that I ate too much fat, and I sometimes probably – you know, had way too many calories. So, so it's been hard. It's been difficult for me to get to a point where I'm like, you know what, I really like the way that I am and I don't weigh myself, but I do find in my clothing that things don't work so well. Since I started taking Metabasol, which has been absolutely amazing. And you guys developed this. So can you tell us about it? Well, I can't wait to see your legs either. So. <laughs> 
That's really sad. Okay. <laughs> no, you know, the... Uh, that they've returned. <laughs> I thought she didn't say when we saw her last, but now she's got more. <laughs> anyway, when... They're better. <laughs> when, when people go on low-carb diets, things change so quick, it almost seems miraculous. They, they, they drop blood pressure very quickly. They... Uh, uh, they resolve they blood sugar fluid uh, retention problems very quickly they drop their blood sugar uh, they they feel better all these things happen go down. yeah lab values change Gert really better. Uh, lab values yeah. as, uh, as soon as we've ever checked anybody is 11 days and there were major changes just within 11 days of starting on a low carb diet uh, but we routinely don't do that but that was a weird situation but the uh, uh, everything really changes quickly but what doesn't change as quickly as everybody wants is weight loss. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to, it takes the time to burn off the excess weight that's stored. Mm -hmm. And so I don't care if people lost 10 pounds a week, they would always want to lose more. <laughs> and so we, we started looking for ways to, to do that, to accelerate weight loss. And that's what led to coming up with metabasol. And it's, it's a different kind of a product. It's a, you know, most weight loss products are, um, Stimulants. Uh, stimulants that kind of increase your metabolic rate in a way and you know with ephedra being the main one but ephedra has got some real downsides mm -hmm. and there there are the pseudo uh, amphetamines like uh, what's that one that's always in the antihistamines uh, phenylpropanolamine phenylpropanolamine that people can get this kind of a decongestant but it's also a stimulant and we've actually had patients come in not, I mean, not our own weight loss patients but patients who uh uh, back as I say, we had a big family practice who came in, who were taking phenylpropanolamine to lose weight, and they actually went into congestive heart failure mm -hmm. because uh, it, it sort of drove their heart a little too hard, I guess for lack of a better term. But uh, anyway, these things are not benign. Ephedra right. and these other things, and every year, you know, somebody dies, or one or more people die from taking ephedra. So we looked at these different weight loss products or different weight loss supplements that worked in different uh, uh, different places in the in the sort of the fat burning pathway and we f uh, we found a, a combination that we uh, uh, thought would work but we didn't know because you couldn't get it really made into a supplement so we uh, casually <laughs> yeah yeah got these in and I mean you it wasn't already made and right. so we got the pills together for it but people had to take a zillion pills and we couldn't get it exactly like we wanted but we had our patients do it and we knew it was harmless we just wanted to see if it was going to increase weight loss and it really did so we thought okay this is we've seen enough we can we can pay the money to do an actual double blind placebo control study mm -hmm. and get the supplement actually made where it's it's you know made instead of people having to take handfuls of pills to do it and so we, we made this supplement that was um, originally called pentabasol because it has five ingredients in it. And we, we hired a clinical lab uh, to do the study. And we told them what they wanted to check. And it was interesting because the guy, uh, when we you know, kind of made our presentation to him, to the director of this thing, he said, well, I've got I, I to gotta tell you right up front that uh, two things. Number one is that we're going to have to make the control diet a low carb diet because in our experience that's the only diet we've ever seen that, that people will really lose weight we'll on. actually <laughs> lose weight in six to eight weeks yeah we'll lose weight in it's six to eight weeks right. it's miserable well, that's and okay. so that's if, if you're not uh <laughs> game for a low carb diet we don't want to do it so we, we got the low carb diet covered mm -hmm. and he said at number two we've tested tons of natural supplements and they just don't work well, they don't so, do much we don't want you to be disappointed because you're going to spend a lot of money to do this. And uh, um, so we just want to, I mean, we just want to give you a heads up that we've tested a lot of these things and they don't work. And we said, well, we've tested them too in our clinic and it works. Well, that's a whole different thing because it's not it's you. double blind and mm -hmm. it's you and there's a placebo mm -hmm. effect and blah, 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 blah. Okay. And so we said, okay, well, we're, we're game to go ahead with a low carb diet with both the study group and the control group and uh, let's do it. And so we, you know, forked over a substantial amount of money to have this done. And I remember 
that I was out actually, I was at Harvard, uh, at the Harvard co-op when I got this call from the guy. And uh, he said, we've, uh, you know, we finished the deal and we've broken the codes because to keep it double blind, every patient is coded because some of them get the placebo and others get, so nobody knows. The people administering it don't know who gets what, the patients don't know who right. gets what. And so uh, he said, we've, we've broken the codes. And he says, I've got some really good news for you and some really bad news. What do you want to hear first? And I said, well, geez, uh, <laughs> give me the good news like first. The good news. <laughs> and he said, he said, you have got an absolutely phenomenal product all the years that we've done testing, we've never seen anything work this well. This works better than drugs work. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're kidding me. That's great. What's the bad? And he said, well, we don't think it's a commercial product. And I said, what do you mean it's not a commercial product? And he said, well, it doesn't, um, doesn't mix people don't well. like it. It doesn't mix because it's a powder and you put it in water and, and stir it up. He says it doesn't mix well, and it didn't. It mixed about like sand. Mm -hmm. And and you kind of have to stir it as, as you drink it to keep it in suspension. <laughs> we have to horse whip people, people to take it. To take they don't it. like it. It's kind of grainy and all that stuff. And immediately I thought, hmm, mm -hmm. it's probably even better than it tested out because a lot of people probably didn't take it. Or didn't like get all of have. it, yeah. And I said, okay, we can solve those problems. So mm -hmm. we went to a different, we went to a, a powder uh, manufacturer. A, a manufacturer that specializes in making powders, and they were able to make it that was really palatable and mixes, you know, like country time lemonade. You just put it in the stir it, and you can put it in sparkling water, and you can put it in still water, mm -hmm. and you take it. You can make it with hot water and drink it as a tea. Right, and you can do it twice a day, do it morning and evening, and unlike uh, a fed or a stimulant product, you can take it when you go to bed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, fact, and sleep and, and take it when you get up. The only thing you've got to take it on an empty stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, so before bed is a good time. Right. So it'll absorb better. Mm -hmm. And people in our in our clinical study that we did, people lost almost double the amount of weight over an eight week study on that as just a low carb diet all by itself. Mm -hmm. So that's why we liked it. And, and the only difficult thing about it is everybody says, Well, how does it work? <laughs> Hard to explain. It's difficult to explain because you know your body has uh, does a lot of what's called feudal cycling, and feudal cycling is just a sort of a chemical cycle that product A converts to product B, that converts to product C, that converts to product D, that converts back to product A, and in the process it burns a lot of energy, but nothing really happens. It's, it's like, like moving going a out. stack of bricks from yeah. over here to over here yeah. to over here to over here. Like, yeah, going out in your yard and taking a stack of bricks and moving them over here and then moving them over here and then moving them over here and then moving them back to where they started. At the end of the day, the bricks nothing's are still changed, where they were. <laughs> but you've expended a lot of energy. Yeah. And that's how this supplement works. It drives some pathways in the liver, basically, to kind of accelerate this feudal cycling. And we all have feudal cycling every day because that's how we maintain our body temperature is through right. feudal cycling because feudal cycles throw off heat. And so this just accelerates that. And one of the, uh, about the only complaint that people ever have on it, or the only thing they remark on in terms of side effects is that they can feel a little bit warm. I don't know if that happened to you, but but that they can feel a little bit warm. It's not like they're just hot. It's not like a hot flash. It's like, uh, you know, everybody's had the experience where they're sitting around and everybody else is comfortable. I've and they definitely say, had it, that. It's hot to me. <laughs> and everybody else said, no, it's not. Well, it's hot to me. And it's that kind of a thing, and it's not all the time, and it's just sporadic. Mm -hmm. But that's the only thing anybody's ever complained about. Uh, It'd be great for people in the UK where it's cold in the winter and damp. Yeah, UK person has vitamin D. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> can we um, can we get that in the UK? Is that something? I don't know. We've never I don't looked think so. at uh, no, we can't even, it. I mean, there's so many export and import laws about with. Consumables. Or, uh, yeah, ingestible yeah. substances. We couldn't even sell it in Canada. Right. It has to be manufactured in Canada in order to be sold in Canada. Oh, okay. In the UK would have to be manufactured by somebody there. But that's, I mean, that's possible if you find somebody that wants to manufacture it that we could partner with. That's possible, I guess. Yeah, I think that would go down amazingly over here. Um, People warm in the winter. <laughs> And, you know, we don't even really actively market it anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used it a lot in our practice, and at one time we really actively marketed it. And it just, I don't know. Yeah. Well, 
we got involved in other things, I guess, but it, it's a, it's an excellent thing. It works really great. Mm -hmm. I think it really, really does. It's, it's one of the only, um, you know, I don't love taking supplements and I obviously don't take stimulants because of my history with other stimulants. So um, I have to stay very far away from anything that, that makes me feel anything strange. And this has been absolutely phenomenal. In fact, sometimes it's the highlight of my day. Because it tastes so good, right? <laughs> it tastes so good. <laughs> no, I promise you, I feel so different. It's really, it's really been amazing. But I also want to ask you, um, you've also dabbling or you have created, not dabbling, you've created an amazing business um, in the appliance world. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's what occupies most of our time now because uh -huh. uh, we're still on the learning curve. But yeah, the there's a, a cooking technique called sous vide, S O U S V I D E, that was developed in France about 50, yeah, 60 70. years ago. Now. And um, it's um, all the great restaurants use it everywhere. And it's a, a really a phenomenal technique to cook almost anything. And you can create products with it that you can't do any other way. Mm -hmm. And that's why all the great chefs like it because it's a real hands-off process. They mm -hmm. have to spend a lot of time and they can they can create a, a pretty terrific uh, end product. And so I read about this, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe, mm -hmm. eight, nine, 10 years ago. And I looked at it and I thought, uh, God, this sounds great. And I found uh, a way that you could sort of cobble one together a DIY uh, way. Yeah, a DIY, DIY one. And I did that. And uh, we. Back up. Who did it? She did it. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> Who and stood over the stove with ice cubes? I found out about it because <laughs> we had a phenomenal uh, room service pork chop, <laughs> in, uh, which I never ordered. I don't even still don't know what possessed me to the order sides. this thing. It had red cabbage and something in oh, the yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. It wanted the side dish. And so anyway, I ordered this in room service. We had driven to Las Vegas for a meeting and uh, got there late. And I didn't want to go down and hassle with the whole restaurant. So we ordered this. And it was just it was. spectacular. And I so, wanted to return my salmon. Yeah. So when I asked them how they did it the next day, they said, sous vide. Sous vide, what's that? But anyway, I read up on it and found out about it. And we... We rigged this thing, or she, she you rigged, rigged it we up. Rigged. Was, I was the one that she managed. rigged it up, and we cooked this, and it was absolutely delicious. But I wasn't going to stand over the stove dropping yeah. ice cubes in for an hour. Yeah, because you have to, you have to <laughs> no keep way. the three. And so I said, we got to get one of these. So I get on the Cuisinart website, and I can't find one. I get on the KitchenAid website, and I can't find one. And I'm thinking, what? So you start looking all over the internet. Start looking all over the internet. All I can find are these commercial units that cost, you know, three and four thousand dollars. And I'm thinking that you know, release all kinds of steam, and make noise, and do all kinds of and stuff. And look like a and commercial. And then I read an equipment. article by a guy named Nathan Irvold, who was the chief technology officer at Microsoft until he got way rich and quit and started doing other things. And one of the things he did is he became a chef and he got really interested in his cooking. And he had written an article that said someday somebody's going to invent one of these for the home and it will revolutionize home cooking. And I thought, well, that must mean there isn't one. And so if somebody's going to do it, might as well be us. Might as well. Why not? So that's what we did. We made the first sous vide for home cooking. And you You've had it, Karen. You've been at our house. You've tasted oh, sous vide cooking. I have yeah. best food I've ever had oh. in my entire life. Honestly, <laughs> that, that was the best oh, week of my that? life. Yeah. Did we cook sous vide in here, Emily? Yeah, we had some ribs. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Right. okay. okay. And, uh, and it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's easy. It's, it's, uh, I mean, the machine does all the work. Right. And so, and it's helpful because it maintains all of the, uh, the nutrients in the food, nothing ex escapes. And it's really nice for cooking fish in the winter inside because there's no smell. Mm -hmm. And we did a little tour with a guy named Heston Blumenthal that everybody in the UK will know. He's a famous chef over there. He came over with us because he's a sous vide pioneer and he mm -hmm. wanted to help kick the thing off over here with us. And so we went with him from coast to coast, kind of cheek by jowl. Mm -hmm. He's really a great guy. He's a, a great major guy. celeb in the UK, but you'd never know it because he's just the nicest, most regular Down guy in the world. Yeah. Very nice guy. And if you ever want to see some, 
fabulous stuff. Go on YouTube and look up Heston Blumenthal and look at his TV show and see the stuff he does. It's just unreal. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we went uh, coast to coast with him and, and did this um, launch. Little this little launch mm -hmm. and he made you know the most fabulous stuff in it mm -hmm. uh and it just uh, the nice thing is so can i yeah I mean, it right. doesn't take Heston and, Blumenthal and that's the to whole do thing it. That's it doesn't it the takes the of place it. Of, a, of a chef like right. that which he freely admits and he talks about what a difference it made in, in his restaurant mm -hmm. uh when he started doing sous vide mm -hmm. and so it's all in the magic of of the unit mm -hmm. that does it and oh that's what i started to tell you about is one of the things that I said, you know, I miss Heston when I, but if something's in sous vide cooking, you don't smell it. And if I come home and, and there's, you know, a roast going or chicken in the oven or something like that, you have it all these so wonderful good. smells. And he said, yeah, but just remember, everything you smell is a taste particle escaping from the food. Mm -hmm. That's a flavor molecule. A yeah, flavor molecule. A flavor molecule escaping. So that's so, one that you're so, not going to get to eat in the food. And so when you when you get it uh, sous vide, the taste is intensified in everything. Mm -hmm. And we always use a, a demo with beets when we're showing it because they're so colorful. And if you cook beets the normal way and you pour the water off, it's purple. And if you do it, and that's sous -vide, all phytochemicals no that have gone down the drain. Yeah. And 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 vegetables, the colorful components are the phytochemicals, and those are the really Important nutrients that mm -hmm. you want to keep, mm -hmm. and so it's. Um, and in sous vide, they're locked into the beet, and they're so delicious. I mean, you could make a beet lover out of anybody with sous vide beets. Yeah, and mm -hmm. if you cook fish with it, you you don't destroy the omega three fats because right. they don't get oxidized because everything is enclosed in the in, in the, the pouch. pouch that they're cooking. In. So anyway, even even the meat though is so tender. I don't think I've yeah. tasted meat like yeah. that. Before. Basically, it cooks in its own juice and fat. So. Mm -hmm. It just, um, uh, it's perfectly cooked and you don't cook it at a high temperature so you don't dry it out and you don't damage the fats that are in it. It's right. just, uh, it's, I think, the ideal way to cook. And it doesn't shrink. And it That's doesn't why shrink. restaurants love it because mm -hmm. if, if you take a 16 ounce steak and you throw it on a grill, you know, steak is like we are, it's about 73% water. So you throw a steak on a 500 degree grill and the water evaporates and the steak shrinks and it shrinks about 20 to 25 percent in size mm -hmm. and when you cook it sous vide it, it can't shrink. And, shrink and so you go in with a 16 ounce steak and you come out with a 16 ounce steak so much much better value for money and then uh, sure Hessen Blumenthal is huge over here in the UK and his stuff oh, is, yeah. oh when the stuff he makes it's like a science experiment half the time yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it is yeah it is. so cool yeah. We had the, the joy and privilege of, of having a meal at the Fat Duck oh, um, one occasion, and all I want is to go back and have another meal yeah. at the Fat Duck. It's so and fabulous. You, you know, when you see Hester on TV, <laughs> and you wonder, you know, what's he like in person? Just like he, that. Exactly. The same. <laughs> just I mean, like he that. is the most regular guy yeah. in the world. Yeah. He's a. Uh, I mean, he is just a, a, an absolute quirky. sweetheart and mm -hmm. quirky, kind of weird. It's really interesting. Kind of funny, funny, really funny. Because you know he's yeah. not as he's not as famous over here, except among the chef community. The real foodies know him because he's just such an icon. And it was interesting because here you go to New York and you want to go to Momofuku and you can't get in. You know, maybe six weeks out if you want to try to get into Momofuku. And so we all went to Momofuku, a party of 10 of us that were on the tour with Heston because they made way for a large party. And the entire night, David Chang was sitting next to Heston in the dining room talking to him. I mean, the, I mean, it, it, everybody just rolled out the red carpet for him because because he's Heston Blumenthal. Yeah. It was great just to kind of tag along in his wake. It was yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Oh, that sounds, I've never been to his restaurant, but I have heard. Save your pennies, that's the, it's well worth it. Oh, I might have to. Uh, you guys have to come back over to the UK and then. <laughs> yeah, we'll all go out together. Perfect. Yay, McCarran has to come over as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm there, with my leg. Are there any good golf courses in Scotland? <laughs> I don't know, I think there's maybe one or two. <laughs> I'm actually heading up there in a few weeks. I'll have some <laughs> pictures for you. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, check them out and let me know. Let me, if they're in a good I will. I definitely will. <laughs> Guys, we're really conscious of your time because uh, we could probably ask you questions all evening, all, all day for you, but we are we, we perceptive of your time with it. So we have one more question that we kind of normally ask everyone, but I'm going to switch up a little bit different for you guys. So we normally ask people, what is your three top tips <coughs> for living a sugar-free life? But I want to ask you guys, what would you say to people are the three top kind of things or ways to get started with living a low-carbohydrate lifestyle? Wow, that's easy. I thought you were going to ask me if I were a tree, what kind of tree would I want to be? <laughs> or something really hard. You do that for next time. <laughs> Um, what's your spirit animal, Michael? <laughs> what's your spirit animal? <laughs> the gopher. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I think the first, the absolute first thing you have to do to live a low carb life or really make any kind of major life change is to decide that you want to do it. I think absent that there's no change that you're ever going to be able to make. So you have to, to, within yourself, commit to give it a try. And the nice thing about a low carb diet is that when you give it a try, it doesn't take long to see the results and, and positive results then feed your, your desire to, to keep going and to keep trying. And so I think the very first thing you have to, to do is to look inside yourself and make the commitment that you're going to do it. And, and then don't let yourself down, stick to that commitment. Um, probably the second thing to do is to, to purge, all the, the sugar and processed food and, and bad oils and everything out of your house. Get them out of your house so that there's not a temptation. And then basically fill the house with uh, meat and fish and eggs and, and cheese and, and you know leafy greens and colorful vegetables and low starch, low sugar fruits and, and really nothing else. And, and just start laying out for yourself a, a plan of what you're going to eat and only have those things there. And, and I think those three things will get you on the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and really, um, get a, a good sense of what a carbohydrate is in the food. Like I told you about when we check people's diet diaries and find out that they're eating bananas and or drinking spaghetti orange instead of spaghetti squash. Right. Sure. And yeah. so you got to really, you got to <laughs> get, a, you gotta get a firm <laughs> grasp of what it is that you're, uh, you know, the and, um, and so that's, that's one of the main things too. And, uh, and really assiduously avoid vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, which, which means that you've got, if you're going to use shortening that you've got to use lard, lard beef tallow, beef tallow. And there are companies, I mean, you that can get can. lard just about anywhere anymore, but, uh, uh, get lard and and get or get coconut uh, coconut oil, oil uh, but avoid vegetable oils butter. because the more and butter yeah butter is great and and ghee. Mm -hmm. but the more I've been looking and reading lately and and getting my stuff our stuff together for this new book uh, the more disastrous I think vegetable oils are mm -hmm. uh, you know because if you look back over all the graphs that people see all the time about I mean, if you look back since the obesity epidemic started, for example, you'll see that people, uh, the amount of carbs people have eaten have gone up. The amount of, of fat that they've eaten has gone down in terms of percentage of calories in the diet. But in actuality, it's gone up a little bit in absolute numbers. And the same thing with protein. People are just eating more in general, mm -hmm. but they're eating many more carbohydrates than they used to. But if, if you look at the amount of vegetable oils they eat on the graph, it just is skyrocketing mm -hmm. because people got so afraid of saturated fats. And if you take McDonald's French fries, for example, they not used that to, you should take them. Yeah, but I mean, they used to be <laughs> made in, in uh, with beef tallow. Mm -hmm. And when everybody went nuts about that, back about the same time that the nutritional guidelines came in, they switched over to being cooked in vegetable oils. They tasted like crap. So food, chemists had to get in and add stuff to give them the taste of beef tallow so that they tasted the same, but they're just a sponge to soak up these nasty oils. Mm -hmm. And so people are eating so much more vegetable. And I think that's a big part of the problem too, along mm -hmm. with the increased carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Sugar and sugar and refl refined flours. Vegetables. That's, get rid of those three things and you'll conquer the world. 
That's exactly what we say in the book, hey, Em, and Sugar Free. Mm -hmm. um, I, so where can people find you? Where can they sign up to your brilliant newsletter? Because uh, it's, it's my favorite newsletter that I receive by far, and I receive many. Um, you know, where can, you, where can we find you guys? Uh, you want our home address? <laughs> <laughs> I've got that. <laughs> no, you can go on uh, www.proteinpower.com. And if you go fronts and, and her blog's on there and my blog's on there, if you go to my blog, uh, I've got Sadly, a, that's the only place that the newsletter sign up is, yeah, is on there's this a, blog. There's a sign up thing on the newsletter up in the upper right. And we won't bombard you with stuff, I promise. And, and fact, you'll wish for more than you get going Yeah, you'll bombarded wish for with, more than you get, but that's where you can sign up. And Fabulous. Just an email list, and I send out. I read a lot, as you can see behind you. This is one of the libraries in the house. We've got three of them in here, but that's the I small one. And yeah, that's so, the little one. so I, yeah, so I send out a, a list of, of kind of book recommendations of books I've read every uh, read in a every month, which may have nothing to do with nutrition. Yeah, and they're very uh, far away. And yeah. then other things that I think would be of interest to readers, I send out from time to time, and links to blog posts I write. Um, and if people want to buy Metabasol, especially obviously those in the United States, where can they find that? Uh, they can go to www.metabasol, M-E-T-A-B-O-S-O-L.com, or they can find it on our website too. Proteinpower.com too. Um, and the sous vide? Sous vide to bring uh, com. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Yeah, or Amazon, they're sold yeah, on Amazon. They can look on Amazon. And in the UK, uh, sous vide tools is our distributor in the UK. For and also Amazon. There. And also Amazon. But uh, sous vide, it's s o u s v i d e s u p r e m e dot com. Mm -hmm. That's um, cruel. And you can find out. Working. I mean, there's there are tons of videos and everything on there. So you don't have to just get on there to buy. You can get on there just to learn about the technique. Mm -hmm. And hundreds of recipes, lots to lots to do on there besides buy. But you're always free to buy. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. The best, best, best food, the best supplements, um, and the, the most amazing newsletter. So uh, we'll have this all written up at the bottom of the YouTube video that you're watching now. Um, and once it goes to podcast, it will be written up in the uh, section that Emily is working on. <laughs> Okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. It was amazing having you with us, and we will see you again soon. Bye. Right. Thanks. Bye. Enjoyed it. Bye-bye.